Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'll upload a copy of the agenda here to chat just in case anybody wants to follow along. Um, but otherwise, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. Thank you so much. And we do ask that everyone stay muted um, unless you're asking a question or presenting just so that we make sure there's no feedback during the meeting. Um, if you forget to mute yourself, I might mute you just to make sure that we avoid that. But if you do have questions, there will be opportunities to raise your hand or jump in um, for the question and answer period during um, the throughout the entire meeting. So without further ado, we'll jump right into our treasurer's report and I will turn the floor over to Eric, our treasurer. Thanks, Jess. Um, let me get, share my screen here. Um, so the first thing I did want to share, um, we did complete our audit, uh, which is more like a financial review, um, uh, not actually a real um, audit, but uh, Matt Patson, who has served as our audit uh, committee, audit chair for the last couple of years, uh, and I met and reviewed our books. He went through a couple of the different accounts and asked a bunch of questions, um, and so he wasn't able to join, but he did send his letter. Um, and so pull that up on the screen. Um, if anyone wants to see it, I'll also send it over to you, Jess, so you can have it as well. Um, so it, unless there's any questions on that, we'll move over to the balance sheet uh, report. So here you can see um, at the end of uh, March, we had a little over $7,000 in checking, um, $12,000 uh, in change over uh, in savings. And then uh, the petty cash balance there is a little up from the uh, chili cook-off that we had for the scholarship fundraiser. Any questions on um, the balance sheet report? Okay. Moving over to our income statement report, you can see this is our comparative for um, the year to date with the current month. So uh, following it along in the current month column, we had a pretty healthy uh, month uh, as far as an income perspective. So we had a couple of um, residential and business memberships continue to come in. The donations uh, is mostly driven from uh, the chili cook-off. Like I mentioned, there was um, some uh, personal donations given through the chili cook-off sales. Um, also, we did receive a check from Kroger Rewards um, that's also included in there. We've also started to get uh, MAP registrations for the fall, sorry, sorry, the spring yard sales. So you can see that there. And then we've also started to invoice um, vendors for the summer festival that's coming up, which I'm sure Jess will give an update for in a little while. And then we did have a personal donation come in um, uh, in the 57 um 96. So that was it from an incomes perspective. Um, for uh, our expenses, we had our usual um, rent and utilities. Um, we did also did have to finally pay our um, insurance. Um, so the financial piece that you see there is our insurance to Westfield Insurance Agency. Uh, that's our annual insurance has not covered the festival. We do have to take a separate rider out um, for the festival, but that's our usual our general liability insurance for the year. Uh, we started to um, have some supply expenses come in for getting ready for the festival and the yard sale. Um, and we've also got our Founders Day uh, coming up. So we've started to incur a little bit of exp uh, expenses there on the supply side. We did up our marketing uh, Facebook um, promo account. Um, we also had our Microsoft and Zoom annual registrations come in. Um, so some technology expenses specific contributions. Um, we attended the Ganther's Place, how sweet uh, it is um, uh, event. And so that was a $25 um, contribution. I'm trying to remember what the other expense is. The grant expense was $60 that we spent um, at the Hey Hey during the chili cook-off um, to have some raffle prizes. Um, and for the life of me, I cannot remember what the hundred dollar expenses. I'll look it up later if anyone has any questions. Um, any questions on the income statement? All right. I will turn it back over to you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Okay, fantastic. Uh, all right, we're going to move on to our guest speaker for the evening, um, wonderfully coordinated by our member at large, David. So David, I'm going to turn the floor over to you and let you introduce our speaker. Yes. So um, our guest speaker today is uh, Steve David. 
um, <clears throat> who is a long time Marion Village resident, or at least longer than me. Um, and he will be talking to us uh, for a few minutes about the Columbus Safety Collective. Um, and, um, and then we'll have opportunities for a few questions. So um, Steve, I'll just let you uh, run through this. Awesome. Thanks so much, David. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Jess uh, and David for hosting me and, uh, and, and folks for, for being here. Uh, um, part of this, you know, uh, I'm Steve. Uh, I live um, on Welch Avenue in Marion Village. Uh, my wife and I have been here uh, for about seven years now. Um, and I, uh, I have to admit, I'm, I've been a little more nervous about giving this presentation than I usually am when I do this. Um, I've given a lot of like testimony and, and talked to a lot of classes and like uh, civic groups about this, but um, there's something different about doing it for your neighbors uh, that just like had me a little... Uh, just a little nervous going into today. So I'm really grateful um, for everybody uh, for allowing me to take a little time. Um, this really came up because at one of our previous meetings, um, one of uh, we had a neighbor who asked a question about um, the REACT program. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of work in this, um, in this alternative uh, response space. Uh, so I thought that I would use a little bit of time to kind of just talk about some of the community organizing that I've been doing, uh, particularly around non-police emergency response, um, and talk a bit about the different programs that the city of Columbus uh, has going right now. So um i'll uh I, I don't have a second monitor so um i'm a little bit more fumbly with my slides but i'll be keeping an eye on the chat also so unmute and ask a question anytime if you want um or uh you know drop a question in the chat i'm happy to address it so um i'm going to talk just a bit about what the safety collective is um kind of give an overview of different alternative response models that exist in our city um i'm going to talk a bit about how our city budgets for public safety and then give some resources um that we can use like in the meantime between um now and when we get to um, a future where some of these programs are built out a little more in a little more robust fashion so the columbus safety collective is a community coalition that i've been a part of uh, for the past three years now dedicated to creating a non-police emergency response program for our city. Um, and we do this work in coalition, um, and we do it in a way that um, is meant to be accountable to people who are most impacted by the criminal legal system um, and promotes investments in long-term community supports. So for us, this is really a question about like getting the resources to our community so that everyone um, can be safe and thriving in our neighborhoods um, and do that in a way that is most equitable. Um, and so the way that we've done this um, over the course of the past two years that we've been organizing together um, is by trying to bring the voices of directly impacted people and our neighbors into conversation around this issue of, um, of policing in our city and, and how we should be responding to all sorts of different crises that we see. Um, so we've run a series of forums, um, you know, since last summer, uh, where we've um, given people the opportunity to, um, to be in conversation with each other. Uh, to talk about things like like what makes them feel safe in their communities and how our city spends money um, in in these areas. So the real central central question for us has really been like like what does safety mean to you and like what makes you feel safe in your communities and giving people the opportunities to think about like what are ways that we could potentially do things better than how we currently are. And so part of the way that we've grounded this work is really in some data that the city of Columbus collected itself. Um, back in the winter of 2021, following um, the Black Lives Matter protests of 2020, the city of Columbus launched this reimagining public safety process. And as part of it, they held a series of hearings as well as launched this community survey um, to which they got around like 4,500 responses. And when you ask people like to prioritize what makes them feel most safe in their communities, um, this graph is a depiction of that. So I know that like the, the things are a little small, so I'll, I'll talk about like what it, it's showing here. And so we ask people like for their number one thing, um, the most common response that they got were things like social supports, which is this purple bar here, um, things like mental health services, which is the yellow, um, addiction and, um, and homelessness services, uh, community programs. So kind of this suite of like upstream preventative methods to make sure that people get their needs met. Um, and folks in our city who took this survey, like saw that as like the most important things to really like stabilizing their neighborhoods and making sure um, that they felt safe where they live. You notice that the red bar, which people um, said most likely, you know, 60% of people put as the least important for their safety um, was formal uniform police patrol. So when we ask the people of the city of Columbus, like what makes them feel safe, like they cite these things like mental health services, community supports programs, um, and the actual like investment in policing is like what's least important to them is, is what they see in their neighborhoods. 
And so for us, a key piece of this was this other question that they asked during that process was, how comfortable would you be with this idea of non-police emergency response? So unarmed civilian teams trained in things like um, like de-escalation, community resources, like those kind of linkages and mental health and trauma. Um, and they actually like, you know, how comfortable are you with this kind of service existing in Columbus? And 80 to 85% of people said that they were somewhat or very comfortable with this for a range of things like mental health crisis, homelessness services, suicide, well checks, general non-emergency things. So there's really broad consensus amongst the people of Columbus when the city launched their own process that like this is the kind of program that we want to see in our city. And these kind of models of doing public safety differently have proliferated across the country, notably since 2020, but is not a new idea. Some of these have been around for decades. Um, but again, since 2020, this idea of non-police teams to deal with things like mental health, but also kind of this like wider spectrum of things that tend to be done by police, but don't necessarily need to be. Um, we've seen these models like really take hold in a lot of different places. So um, in, in Durham, North Carolina, um, in Albuquerque, um, in Minneapolis, in Olympia, um, we've seen some of these cities create their own departments that house kind of this range of alternative services. Um, so things like non-police response, um, but also follow-up mechanisms, as well as call diversion. So like in the call center, how we deal with 911 calls that come in. So you, you may have heard so, about a bit of this, like in the city of Columbus, um, the mayor has, uh, has talked about it on several occasions, done a number of press conferences, um, talking particularly about um, this uh, right response unit that we have here in Columbus. And so, like some of these other cities, we have this range of what you could call public safety alternatives that already exist here. So we have the Right Response Unit, which is a call diversion program that is social workers embedded in the 911 call center. And so calls that um, folks think that they can uh, deal with over the phone first or um, potentially totally resolve over the phone are starting to get routed to the RRU to have that person talk to the social worker, kind of assess the situation better before determining what kind of response they need. We also have the mobile crisis response unit, which is a social worker CPD or social worker and police co-response program where they will um, respond to calls together uh, that are deemed um, things like in the, in the kind of mental behavioral health sphere involving suicide or threat of self-harm. And then we also have two um, specialized follow-up mechanisms. Um, so the REACT program, which was what one of our neighbors brought that kind of like prompted this discussion, um, is a collaboration between police, fire, and Southeast Mental Health that does follow-up services for folks after they experience an overdose. So if someone, someone ODs, they call 911, the ambulance shows up, you know, then they stabilize that person. Um, but those folks won't always like go to treatment like right away. Um, so the REACT program is designed to go and follow up with those folks within 48 hours after an overdose event and basically has like a direct line into treatment to try and get them um, the um, the addiction or mental health, behavioral health services that they that those folks need. So that's the REACT program. Again, it's like a follow up mechanism it isn't responding to active 911 calls usually, but um, is, is meant to connect those folks to services that they need. Um, and then finally, we have the SPARK team, um, which is primarily for um, Seniors and People with Disabilities is an EMT and social worker partnership where folks who are frequent 911 users, typically um, people who have trouble ambulating, like getting around their house, like getting out of bed, getting out of the bathroom, um, will call 911 for these non-emergency things. And so Spark is meant to catch those folks and do the other service linkage that's needed um, for them to not have to utilize ambulance services for those kind of things. And so for, for us in the safety collective, like a piece of this is like making sure that we're like, you know, that non that like a non-police response team is a critical missing piece of this, that we don't have a non-police team that will go out to the scene um, to deal with people's um, mental behavioral health issues, but also like any other kind of things where you would call for some help, um, but may not want to involve law enforcement in that interaction. And so a big piece for this process is like just how our city budgets um, like how our city spends its money, like at, at a big scale. So um, this is the 2023 operating budget that the city of Columbus passed in February. Um, it was a, a $1.1 billion budget. Um, and you'll notice that um, a, a third of it goes to paying for law enforcement. And um, if you account for fire and public safety administration, like two out of every $3 the city spends are in public safety. Um, and so some of the other 
these other things that that the safety clients would think are important, like these kind of upstream interventions that our, our neighbors mentioned as the important things to them, like social supports and health and addiction services. Um, you know, Parks and Rec pulls down like 5% of the budget and um, Department of Public Health pulls down around three. So for us, this is like a, a significant discrepancy in like the things that people point to and want for their, their public safety interventions and how we're actually spending our dollars. And so these existing programs that Columbus has, you know, the right response unit, the MCR, Spark and React, um, they account for like four and a half million dollars out of this, um, you, you know, compared to the the um, like 370 million for police um, and like 275 million for fire. And so a really like small piece of the overall public safety spending picture. And so as part of the 2023 budget process, um, we and we'd like to say as, um, you know, like in response to some of the advocacy that the safety collective has been doing with our public events over the course of the past year, um, uh, President Hardin added a budget amendment for um, $1.2 million to stand up a non-police emergency response program. And Mayor Ginther also kicked in an additional $3.5 million for the existing alternatives that we have on the books. But as you'll see, like that amount of spending compared to like what we're currently spending on police and fire is like really dwarfed like by those other programs. And so the way that the Safety Collective has been talking about this work is really like around these policy pillars that we developed in consensus um, with people who are doing this organizing with us and are in community around this kind of work. So wanting to see non-police emergency response stood up in our city where people can call for help. And, and if they don't want law enforcement contact, they don't have to have it. Um, and then really viewing this as a new way to like an opportunity to rebuild our public safety system. So prioritizing community workers just like anyone can take a civil service exam to become a police officer or firefighter. Um, people should be able to apply for this work and get trained to do it. City investment with high quality jobs, and then really like taking up this crisis of accountability that exists with law enforcement and building that in at the beginning. So having it be responsive to a community advisory board and building in high quality evaluation into the pilot and beyond so that our spending decisions and the way we scale these programs can be informed by data. And so in the meantime, a piece of this for us is always thinking about like making those critical decisions about if you're like, uh, if you're going to utilize emergency services, being aware of potential risk that it puts some of our neighbors at based on their social location. So in the, if, if people are being harmed immediately, if there's another way to intervene, so, um, pretend, like, and, um, just the reality that like if something is worth calling 911 for, um, often should should require us like being willing to stick around to see what happens for that. And recognizing that people's identities can place them at, at greater risk when encountering law enforcement. Um, so black, indigenous people of color, uh, folks with disabilities, young people, um, people who are experiencing homelessness or LGBTQ plus. Um, so really encouraging folks to like think critically about like what kind of emergency services we're relying on. And so while the city is standing up this non-police emergency response program that we've been doing this advocacy for, I want to note that um, both um, NetCare Access um, has a mobile crisis service um, that you can call and specifically request if you see someone who, you know, may be intoxicated, maybe experiencing homelessness and like um, you want to get them some help but don't necessarily want to involve police, um, you can always call the NetCare number. They also have a text line. And the Nationwide Children's Hospital has the um, has a, a program known as the Mobile Response and Stabilization Services, um, which is for um, for young people. It's for um, for youth experiencing mental and behavioral health crisis, um, and is a like on scene crisis response service that they try and um, dispatch it within a couple hours of that call. So we have some of these resources available to us um, in our city now. Um, so if any of this has been interesting to you, or you have, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions now if I uh, haven't gone too far over time. Um, but if you want to plug into some of the work that we're doing, you can definitely catch us on social media or, or check out some of the links to stuff that we're doing uh, on our link tree. I'll, um, I'll put in here the, um, the link for the, um, my slides if you want to like review any of this stuff more directly. Um, but that's kind of the overview of what we've been doing. Uh, really grateful to David for, uh, David and Jess for giving me the time for this and uh, happy to address any questions that folks may have. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I think we, I don't know, Jess, if you were keeping time, I think we have a couple minutes. Yes. Just maybe one or two questions. Yep, we absolutely have a few minutes left. So folks, I don't see any hands raised yet, but if anyone has any questions for Steve, please feel free to jump in. Um, love to make sure you have the opportunity to ask those while he's here. Or of course, if you'd like to review the slides later, he did post that link as well. But just want to see if there's, Eric, I see you unmuted. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, Steve, thanks for so much for um, the, the 
presentation. How can like us as neighbors, like, is there a role for us to play as either a civic organization or individual neighbors? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. So I think like one thing is like, if, if you're interested, like in, in plugging into the work directly, like drop me a line and I'm like happy to connect you with like the work that we're doing ongoing. Um, one of the, as the city put up this money, um, the way that they're planning to try and stand up this program is is in one way by staffing a community advisory board. Um, and so the Safety Collective is hoping to have a series of events to source people for that board um, as they they start to implement some of these programs. So that's going to be one place where like you could definitely like get, get engaged with it. Um, there's also going to be ongoing conversations around this piece, but also um, the city has created a new office of violence intervention um, that they're planning to do like a series of public listening sessions around. So I would say like, check out like, you know, um, plug in with us on social. If you want to kind of like get the deeper dive, like drop me a line directly. Um, but I think like keeping an eye like on this space and how the city like starts to build out these programs. It's a really exciting time nationally and like for us also here in Columbus. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. And Steve, I would love to add any of the, you mentioned several different resources during the presentation. I know you have some in your slide, um, but I'd love to get with you on kind of uh, summarizing some of those resources that we can share. We do have a resource page on the website where we've got, you know, city contacts and other things that people, you know, might need at a, at a quick glance. So I'd love to add some of those to the page as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Any other questions before we wrap up this portion? Okay. Steve, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Yeah. We really so much appreciate for making the time, it. guys. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, folks. All right, we're going to move into our next item here. Uh, we have one zoning item on the agenda for this evening. So I will be turning the floor over to our zoning chair, Tate, to introduce that application. Uh, this is actually a reapplication. I'm sorry, a revised application. Um, this application was presented in January, I believe. Um, there have been some additions to additions and changes to the variances that were requested. So we're going through this process again. Um, if you're not familiar with this process, if this is your first time, we'll have a total of 15 minutes for presentation and questions. Um, the applicant will present on the variances that they're requesting, then we'll start collecting questions about those variances. Tate will bring that up on the screen and we'll type out the questions as they're asked. Um, and then we'll take the last portion for the applicant to present or to respond to those questions. Um, we're going to do something a little new today as well. We're trying to take some additional feedback. So at the end of the presentation and questions, we will also take any comments you might have, um, bearing in mind that those comments will um, basically just get passed along to the area commission and to the city with our recommendation, um, just to make sure if you've got anything you want to share, you can. Um, but that's just kind of a little extra piece that we're going to add on to the, the back portion um, after we've had our question and answer period. So Tate, the floor is all yours. And to clarify those comments, thank you, Jess. Um, and those comments can be put in the chat, correct? So we can send those on. So yes. just remember to type those out. Mm -hmm. So we, we won't be taking those verbally, but we'll also uh, be have those in the chat so everybody can read those. And yes. like I said, like Jess said, we will pass those on to the commission as well. Um, so thank you, Jess. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, we have one uh, zoning variance, as, as Jess mentioned, that's 1717 South High Street. Um, John, I, I believe you're here with us and are doing the presenting, so I'll let you go ahead and share your screen. We can go ahead and get on the way. Hello. Tate, do you want to do the presentation of the variances, or do you want me to go through it all? You have five minutes to go through the, the variances, John. Okay. So similar to the process of uh, of what you did in January. So if you want to share your screen and show the map and all, all the changes, you certainly can do that. Great. So um, I've been retained by the owner of the property to resolve uh, code violations that have been going on for some time on this property. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, the tenants of the property don't get brought into uh, environmental court. It's typically the owner. Um, and he would like to get uh, these issues cleared up. Uh, the root of the issue is that the previous site plan uh, is from 1975. Uh, it's an approved site plan uh, for building 
that was built as a muffler shop by Midas Muffler in 1970. And it got an addition on the back in 1975 or 76. And at that time, those plans were approved. And that's where the existing approved site plan is. Since 1975, there was the uh, community commercial overlay that has changed um, the code um, that affects maneuvering uh, and parking between the right of way and the front of the building. However, there is an exception through the PZA that allows parking and stacking in front of the buildings uh, if it was designed in such a way that that was the main access for the building and its use. So that's kind of the condition that we have. Um, and the variances that we, the January meeting uh, with you, I didn't have the benefit of the staff uh, report from the city. Uh, traffic has asked that, um, that we get a variance for the view triangle uh, because it is impinged uh, at one of the curb cuts by one of the parking spots that we want to get a variance for in front. Um, we would like to ask for two parking spaces in front, one for the handicapped and an additional space. Um, and we need uh, the ability to stack one operable vehicle as a drop-off um, uh, for overnight as long as that vehicle is moved in the morning um, in front of the service stores. So we need a variance uh, also for the maneuvering between the building and the parking setback line. We need a reduction of one parking space overall because we do not have appropriate maneuvering space in the rear of the building uh, to meet the current code. And um, that's it, I'm sorry, I repeated. Um, so I, I realized that we didn't uh, get approval in January, we're asking for for more now, um, we reached out to the neighbors from the South uh, who I see are also here at the meeting. So we'll hear from them, but just to point out, they have a handicap and a single parking space and maneuvering in front of their building as well. We're not asking for any more or less, uh, especially for buildings that were, were built way before the uh, the overlay. Um, I've worked it through this with traffic and I worked through it with planning. Um, we're going to do a couple other things. Uh, we're going to remove the uh, added rectangular sign that uh, was added at some point and stick with the uh, original pylon sign that's still there. And uh, we're going to clean up the building facade and paint it um, and make it more presentable to uh, to the street. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, and and I realize, you know, this is going to go to uh, besides Marion Village, this goes to Southside and it'll go to BZA and uh, I look forward to uh, meeting on site. Uh, I believe it's Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Thank you. Thanks, John. Okay, so Tate's got the list of variances pulled up on the screen there just so everybody um, can easily see those. So um, we're going to open up the floor now and start taking questions. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left for this presentation and, and questions and answers. So if you've got a question, please either use the hand raise feature to let me know that you'd like to speak. Um, you can also post your question to chat if you prefer. Um, and then we'll just start taking those. Tate's going to put those up on the screen. Um, and then again, if you do have any of those just comments that you want to share, you can feel 
free to put those in chat anytime since we're just going to pass those along to the city um, after the presentation. So feel free to do that at any time. I will, however, also be putting into chat the, uh, the voting link. So if you're a current member and you're going to be voting tonight on these variances, um, you can do so whenever you feel prepared. Um, we'll make sure that voting wraps up within a few minutes of the presentation. So I'll put that link out there for folks to use when they are ready. Um, otherwise, I don't see, oh, I see one hand raised, David. Uh, yeah, so I, I was here at the January meeting. I don't have a perfect memory of exactly what was asked for in that meeting. So I don't know if it's possible like very quickly um, to just sort of sum up um, what new is being asked for this time, um, which which of those variances were not at January. And then is there anything else? I know you mentioned um, um, uh, something about the facade and about removing a sign, but kind of what's the uh, the gist of um, maybe what's been changed with this application that might address some of the previous concerns. So if, if that's possible to just sort of, get, you know, sum up what you what you said, so I really understand what the differences are. That's very helpful. Actually, uh, that's a great point, David. I, I should have asked that myself. Um, John, would you would you mind going ahead and responding to that now, just because that might inform some of the questions that folks have, and I don't want to have too much back and forth. So um, could you just uh, respond to that now? Yes. Thank um, you. We have <clears throat> the reduction of, of one required space because um, there is not, um, well, we have initially asked for more parking in front and we've reduced it to two, uh, to two spaces, which is what traffic will allow. So um, there isn't a, appropriate maneuvering space in the back of the building to allow another parking space. So we had to ask for an additional reduction in parking of one space. Um, and then because of the changing of the way of the orientation of the parking spaces in the original application, which the cars were running north-south, I'm sorry, we're running east-west, we're running north-south and um, it creates a vision triangle issue with the north uh, curb cut. And so it's kind of a technicality, but um, that vision triangle impinges on one of the parking spaces that was rotated. Uh, so we need to ask for that. Um, and I can also tell you that the uh, right away, or the parking setback line where these vision triangles take place are 15 feet from from the from the curb, so there's adequate um, vision there, and um, traffic doesn't have an issue with that. Thank you for that, John. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Hello. Hi, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have a question. This is Jeff Mackey. I was the attorney for the uh, neighbors next door when they purchased their property seven years ago, and they were very concerned about uh, parking, ingress and egress, visibility, all the issues that, that you're already uh, addressing. Uh, I informed them that they wouldn't have any issues because they, the next door neighbor, that is the applicant, could not use their property in a way that was impinging on my client's use. Um, it sounds like, and I'm a little confused also of exactly what they're asking for, but if I understand what the uh, spokesman was saying, it says there are various zoning violations which they're seeking to address by way of a variance. Um, why can they not seek to address the, the zoning um, offenses by just complying with the zoning code without asking this body to impose a much more intensive parking use in the front of the building. Why can't they just comply with the code? Thank you. We will add that and get that to the answer portion at the end. Any other questions? We have more. Okay, we have several more and how much more time we have. 
Uh, uh, we only have about two minutes left for this this presentation. Okay. And so if, okay. if there are several questions in the room that you're in, I do need to ask if there are questions from any other folks as well, because we want to make sure everybody does have an opportunity to ask questions. Okay. Yeah, um, I don't see any hands raised at the uh, moment. I got, I got so. one up. I'm here. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, others who are not in, in the room with you. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that we capture everyone. But it doesn't look like any hands are raised. So, yes, we do have about a minute and a half left if you want to go right ahead. I'll, I'll try and be uh, uh, short. Um, I purchased the property I live in in 2006, so I have a little bit of uh, experience uh, down in this neck of the woods, and I've watched these properties since 2006. There has been some improvements. The biggest improvement, obviously, is the one that we're standing in, but the, uh, the, the I watched two di couple different owners over here and a couple different businesses in and out of there use tire shafts and all that stuff. And the same problems exist today that existed in 2006. And for me personally, and I don't want to be obstructionist, but it looks to me like we have the same problems in 2006 we have today. And the initial issues that are have to be addressed before we get variances for things that aren't broken. And my name is Ed Kane. I live at 1733 South High with my wife. Okay, thank you. I just want to make a quick note. So this portion is for questions specifically. If you do have comments that you want to pass okay. along. Um, My you question can... is, why would we have to go to put in variances to fix things that haven't been fixed in, in well, 15 years, I know. Okay. Now, I got a quick question. Sure. The last time we addressed this, and it hasn't addressed, there's no variance request for the additional parking on Woodrow. They got 17 cars there. As you can see out back on this thing right now, there's 15 cars. I don't know why they say four cars, which they say they can't put more back. But they got 15 cars sitting there. Why can't they put the cars they want to stack for overnight parking in the back? There's plenty of access. In the front, you can see on the cameras too, it's crowded. Let's talk about really quickly. What about the uh, triangle? If the docks truck is there, we will not be able to see out. What about the constant parking on High Street from Woodrow? to uh, the curb cut, which the trucks are there for seven months and cars are there for weeks. They don't move their vehicle. What confidence are we going to have that we will not have to call the police, the fire department continually, 311 hundreds of calls. What confidence do we have that this variance will stop over 45 cars right now, which are on that property and controlled by that property? What confidence do we have that this variance after six years of police, 311, fires, fire department, fights, arguments, we got people afraid to go to work. What are we going to have the confidence that this people, those people next door is then? Last question, that you've got two businesses, it's a one business, where is the plans for the inside? You don't have two bathrooms. Where are the plans for a two business? That's a one business plan. Where are the plans? Where are the plans for two business? That's my question. There's none there. Where, the next question, where's the plan I, for the oil uh, refuge? I'm sorry, where's I'm sorry. Plan? I just need to interrupt for one moment. So uh, as far as my understanding, the variances that we are listed here, those are the only ones that are part of this application. So if there are other code compliance issues or problems with the building, and, and I don't know if there are or not. We can't really address those in this setting, um, but you certainly should and can, you know, continue to work with okay. the city and, and the local reps like Catherine Call and Nancy Pryor right. Sully. They'd be more helpful for that. that. I'm, my time's up, and I don't, that's what I want to say. We've been doing this for five years. There's a couple hundred complaints for 311. We've been working with, this, with the police, the fire. We've been working with the liaison. We, we, we've been working with lawyers. We've been working with them. Jeff, you, you've come here three times and talked, two times and talked to them. And they, they said, Jeff, you can't talk to us. You got a suit on. They are abusing <laughs> us. Since the last meeting, I will tell you, they have been, everybody here will tell you, we are under assault. They block our cars. They block our driveway. They won't let us out. They want an argument every five minutes. I, I'm i sorry. I, I understand your frustration, but we are not able to address this in this forum. So that, that's my point. To do with parking. The parking has to do with the over parking. That's why we're I completely agree. Out. And we, we certainly will ask for answers to those questions, but we cannot address the conflict in this meeting. We simply don't have that capacity. So we do need to just kind of move on here and start capturing additional questions about the variances. We will handle that portion as that is within our purview. Thank you, Justin. Yes, we will move on to the answer portion um, since we've concluded the question portion. Um, so thank you all for 
putting your questions in. I, I will remind folks, if you do have comments, please put them in the in the comment box because we will um, send it. I will clean it up and I will send it up to the city in a PDF. So if you have comments that would like to be um, taken up with this process and this application, I will we will forward those on to the, to the um, city as this process continues. So please put that in the, in, in the chat. Um, okay, Don, can you go ahead and answer the question two through five here? Two through five, okay. So uh, the code says with the community commercial overlay says no maneuvering of vehicles between the right of way and the building facade. So if you've got a four or a five door um, automobile service building, single purpose built, um, you have to drive in those doors to get to the racks. So that's the reason why you need to get the variance. Now, the way that the building was built and the way that the parking was allowed back in 1975, they were allowed to count the spaces in the building as parking spaces. You can't do that anymore. There are 15 foot and 20 foot drive aisles and maneuvering that zoning, um, you know, that's the rules now. Uh, it's changed from the old days. Um, I am not representing that the tenants of that building are uh, are using the site plan per code, but in order to resolve the code violations, we have to get an approved site plan that meets the zoning code and apply for variances as necessary, which is what we're doing. And I don't think they've anybody's done this in six years. Uh, so I, I respectfully submit that we're just trying to get uh, the site plan between the wickets. Um, why can't, so I think I responded a bit to three there. Uh, That's there, fine, there you can move on. Uh, four, why can't they put the cars in the back? Well, they can only put, if you look at the site plan, there's a storage pen area and a parking area, and that's how they're going to have to use that that area to meet um, both the site plan and the zoning code. Um, so, I'm sorry. So what's the answer to that one, Don? What's the reasoning? Uh, we are, we are re we're revising the parking that's in the back of the building to be code conforming parking and maneuver. Um, so that's part of this plan and that's how they're agreeing to utilize the space. Um, so I think that addresses that. Um, and then where are the plans for the inside of the building? Um, that is not part of the code issues here. But I will, as an architect who's been practicing at a German village for near 40 years now um, and familiar with Columbus, they have an occupancy permit um, to use the building as it is. Um, obviously, the toilet room restrictions were completely different uh, in 1970 when the building was built. Uh, it, it conformed to code. Um, the building permits were issued, signed off on, approved, and the buildings were given certificates of occupancy. They haven't changed the use, so uh, they haven't uh, been um, subject to upgrading uh, any of the internal plans of the building. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, the the voting application or the voting form, excuse me, is in the chat. Um, so please go ahead and vote now if you have not already. We will leave this open for a few moments to make sure everybody has an opportunity to vote. 
Um, we will provide a vote count this evening, just so everyone knows where the votes have landed on the four uh, variances. But do note, however, that we will need to review uh, after the fact and ensure that everyone that voted um, is a member with current voting rights. And once we have verified that and confirmed the vote numbers, that is when we will pass them along to the area commission representative, along with any comments. Um, at this point, it doesn't look like anyone shared any comments in the chat. Um, but if you do have some that you'd like us to include, please do please do include those now um, as we have the next few moments open for, for voting. So we'll still be able to collect those. Madam Chairman, I have a procedural question. Uh, there was a, a letter uh, presented to uh, uh, Mr. Tate, uh, wedding from dated April 4 this year, mm -hmm. with a series of questions from telecom products. Will that be part of the record as this case gets submitted on for further consideration? So the questions, the question process is something that occurs only during the public meeting. We don't have any type of absentee voting process or submission for these reviews outside of our actual public meetings. So if you do have questions that you want to ask, or if you do have comments that you want to share, those would need to be done during this meeting so that they are public and so that they can get passed along with everything. Then you give us time to type this in there. And that was yes. also yes, emailed. Yeah. I'm sorry. Right. Yes, you, you can certainly you can certainly comment that. That's what we've been saying here. Yep. So you can certainly type that in the comments. Mm -hmm. And that's why I also emailed to, to, to Rick last night as well, that we'll be taking all public comment here. Yes. Um, and, and so that way it's one, it's recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, and also that we'll be able to have, again, people will be able to see that as they're voting. So yep. it's, it's public forum here for a reason here. Yeah. So and thank then, you so of much course, for your question as well. We don't have the exact date information, um, but we do have the links on our website. There will be meetings held by the area commission and by the uh, city with to review this process, which they do for for any right. application. So we do encourage you to attend those if you're able um, and share your feedback there as well as their processes might look a little different than ours, especially the one that is directly with the city, um, as they would have uh, more of an ability to address things if there have been ongoing issues. But for our process, um, we do appreciate everyone asking questions and sharing comments if you do have them that we can pass along. Um, okay, so before I close voting, is there anyone that still needs a little bit more time to vote? Gets to vote. So voting is uh, only el eligible for current Marion Village members who have paid dues at least 21 days um, from before today's meeting. That is um, stated in our bylaws. That's those are the votes that we can accept. Thank you. All right, folks. Uh, I'll go ahead here. We will close down the form for voting. One moment. Did anyone else need to see the variances again? Or are we good to go? Okay. Okay. All right. The current vote counts that we have uh, looks like they are the same for all four variances. So I'll just kind of summarize all four at once. Um, so we have, uh, I'm sorry, they are not. Oh, yes, they are. Okay. So for all four of the variances, we have a total of six votes, three in support, two opposed, and one abstention. So that is three in support, two opposed, and one abstention. So uh, our recommendation will be passed along, giving that information to the area commission. Again, we will of course review these votes to make sure everyone that did vote um, was eligible to do so, but we'll pass that along. And um, we'll, if you still post any comments into the box before the meeting ends, we will certainly include those as well. Um, so no, no issue there, but. Okay, thank you all so much for, for participating in this process. John, thank you for coming back to represent. Um, we do appreciate that and um, Again, if, if anyone wants to continue with this process further, there will be meetings held by the Area Commission and by the city um, as part of their due process. So, okay, thanks so much, folks. We're going to move on to our next agenda item. Thank you. All right. Our next item on the agenda, we're going to talk about Founders Day. Uh, so the Marion Village Association was actually founded on April 23rd in 1985 when the first meeting was held. Um, Marion Village was much larger back then. In fact, it's extending uh, on our eastern border all the way to Lockbourne. So it, things have changed quite a bit, um, but we are kind of eager to get an opportunity to celebrate Founders Day this year. This will be the first time um, that we've done this, so we're excited. Um, right now, we're still putting this event together since it's new. We were hoping to have food trucks at the event. Doesn't look like any will be available, um, but we will have uh, some, some activities set up at our info center. We're going to have a plant exchange, also a book exchange. So if you've got books you'd like to share, kids' books, 
books, adults books, you know, whatever age range of reading, um, great place to come and exchange, get something new and, and share something you loved with someone else. Also plants, if you've got plants you'd want to share and you want to find some new things to put in your garden or in your home, we'll, we'll be doing that as well. Um, we're planning to have an art activity that will be for both kids and adults where we're going to paint rocks that we will place into our local parks like Walker Park and uh, Moeller Park. So when you're out for a walk with the family and friends, you can kind of look around and see if you can spot the rock you painted. So pretty excited about that one. Um, and we're going to have a toast. So we'll we'll have possibly maybe some mimosas. I'll I'll leave that to people who are, are better at those things. Eric and David, that'll be your domain. But we'll have a nice little toast at the info center as well for those who are 21 and older um, and want to come toast and celebrate Marion Village with us. So looking forward to that. Stay tuned for news. We'll get a poster out soon. Um, but that's going to be Saturday, April 22nd, uh, likely from 12 to 4 p.m. So primarily housed at the Marion Village Info Center. So we hope everyone will stop by and celebrate with us. All right, uh, next item here, we'll just touch on the fact that we are in planning for the Marion Village Festival. So the festival this year will be held on Sunday, August 27th. That will be from 12 to 6 p.m. We are already well into signing up vendors and have gotten several applications for food trucks this year. Um, applications are also open for live music performances. Um, so very eager to see what's going to come through. Folks are really excited. As always, we're excited. We'll be announcing our 2023 logo, logo contest soon. So if you live or work in Marion Village and you want to maybe design the logo that will appear on this year's special run t-shirts and festival mugs, David presenting last year's winner, uh, that will be something you're able to do. And we're really excited to see what kind of submissions we get. So um, look forward to that being announced very soon as well. We'll be touching base with the festival committee tomorrow. Um, if you'd like to help plan the festival, please let us know. We'd love to have you join. And if you maybe just want to volunteer for the festival at the actual event, we'll certainly let you know as we get closer to that date. Uh, let's see here. So Fitness in the Park, we are bringing back Fitness in the Park this year. It will run in Saturdays at 9, I'm sorry, on Saturdays at 9 a.m. in Moeller Park, May through September. So very exciting there. We're currently taking applications uh, from instructors. Looks like we'll have several of our instructors returning from previous years. Um, typically, this is a mix of classes, primarily various forms of yoga. There are also going to be some HIT classes. Um, so if you know an instructor who'd like to participate, please have them fill out our form. Form. We'll be getting that schedule going very soon. So there's a little time left for them to apply for that. Um, and then, of course, we'll be announcing what those classes are and hope that everyone will be joining us starting uh, May 6th, which is actually the same day as our yard sale. Speaking of our yard sale, that is going to be uh, Saturday, May 6th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. This is our biggest yard sale of the year. Uh, always a bit more popular than the one in fall, probably because of football. So, you know, we'll, we'll embrace it. Hopefully it will be a beautiful day. Um, registration for that is open. If you are a member of the association, you can register for that map for free. If not, you can register for $5. Um, we will also that day be hosting a spring cleaning drive immediately following the uh, yard sales. So if you had a sale that day and didn't sell everything, you can bring them down to the info center. Uh, or maybe if you're just, you know, doing some spring cleaning, cleaning out your garage, uh, old kids things, we will be taking your donations um, on behalf of Goodwill and then shipping them off to, to a new life. So um, that'll be between 3 p.m. when the sale ends and 5 p.m. So. Hoping everybody is excited about that again. It's always very popular. Uh, let's see here. Lauren, do you want to give an update on the scholarship? Lauren, are you still there? Yep. Hey, um, so the scholarship was, um, the applications were due at the end of March. Um, we're going to extend that just to get a few more applicants, hopefully. So um, we'll be releasing that. Um, as soon as we get that figured out. Um, but yeah, once so the committee, once we have all the applications in, the committee will meet and um, determine winners. Awesome. Thank you so much. Eric, do you happen, I think you already did this during the treasurer's report, but do you happen to have those numbers of um, our, our total funds raised the day of the chili cook-off again? Sorry, I know I'm totally putting you on the spot. <laughs> Let me look them up. Okay. I'll, and put them in the, I'll put them in the chat. 
And if you didn't get an opportunity to come to the Chili Cook-Off um, or you just want to help support the scholarship, um, our online fundraiser for that is still open. You can access it from the front page of the Marion Village website, marionvillage.org. Um, that is a Facebook fundraiser. So if you don't have Facebook, you can also just go to the donate page on our website and specify that you'd like to make a donation toward the scholarship. So um, here when the scholarship uh extended deadline closes in a couple weeks or so, um, then the committee will be coming together and looking at how much was raised in funds this year to determine what can be awarded. So still some time to raise funds if you're interested. Um, and we would also appreciate sharing that with, with your neighbors um, and folks who might like to contribute. All right, let's see here. Sorry, folks, I kind of lost my place on my agenda for just a moment. Um, Lauren, is Mike with you? And is there a uh, social that he'd like to talk about? Hey guys, I'm here. Um, yeah, so this month's uh, happy hour will be uh, again on the third Thursday, which is the 20th, April 20th, um, and it will be at Eight and Sand Tavern. So, um, and at 6 p.m. So, Eight and Sand, April 20th, 6 p.m. Hope to see you there. They have uh, good food, uh, really good happy hour drink specials. So, I'll be there and I think some other people. So, wear your Marion Village shirts if you want to. Look really cool. Awesome. Thank you, Mike, for continuing to organize this and hope everybody can come out. Okay, let's see. No updates right now on beautification uh, or membership. We will hopefully have some information on membership soon. Um, thanks to someone, uh, a member who is helping to volunteer who's actually here tonight. Hi, Lydia. Uh, so we'll, we'll be talking about some ways that we're looking to um, increase membership and visibility, make sure folks know about the association and how they can get involved if they'd like to do so. All right. Uh, otherwise, let's just talk quickly about the events that are coming up. So the Southside Area Commission has their monthly meeting on Tuesday, April 25th from 630 to 8 at the Parsons Library. Uh, we've got Founders Day coming up on April 22nd, likely again from 12 to 4. The next monthly meeting is Wednesday, May 3rd. We hope everyone will be here for that. Uh, we will have a guest speaker, David, am I correct, auditor? Uh, I need to reconfirm that, okay. but yes, that's the plan. Okay, I believe we'll have a representative, Beth Fairman Kinney, who actually used to previously be um, our neighborhood liaison, is now with the auditor's office, and there will be auditor audits coming up for all of our properties again uh, to potentially see if they can increase those taxes. So they want to make sure everybody's prepared for that process. There will be a challenge or a kind of a response or process if you feel that your your house is being overvalued which of course with older houses can happen sometimes so um we'll look for beth to share information with us uh, i again i believe at the next meeting so don't miss that next month uh, and then of course our yard sale coming up may 6th so looking forward to that we'll have a digital map available to everyone a week before so that you can start plotting out your yard sailing routes and last but not least the donation drive immediately following the yard sale which again we hope will fill those bins for Goodwill and uh, give us all some extra space in our homes and garages that I'm sure we would all love to have. Uh, otherwise, is there anyone? Oh, Eric put in the chat. So we raised $259 from in-person donations during the chili cook-off. So this one was a little bit smaller than years past, but the folks who showed up were really amazing and, and got into our raffle and we really appreciate everybody being there. So thank you so much. And always, as always, thank you for helping us raise funds for this scholarship. We, we really do love this, this project and we're glad we can keep doing it every year. Otherwise I'll open the floor. Does anyone have questions, comments, anything they would like to share before we adjourn this evening? Jess, I'm curious about um, what is it that led Marion Village to shrink at some point between 1985 and now. Is it just that <laughs> I don't people know. over here to our <laughs> east decided they wanted more of their own identity or you know it's I funny didn't realize that the boundaries have changed. I don't know. I know that so I know that our our um southern boundary on Moral where it becomes Hungarian village for a few streets. I know that that change is more recent. Um, I I think it's probably still like 15, 20 years ago, but uh, prior president Bob Lichty kind of told me about that. And just, you know, there was a group that was really um, happy about their neighborhood and wanted to kind of uh, start their, their neighborhood association. So that's when that portion broke off. But um, when you think about how much <laughs> space there is between where we end now at Parsons and then, you know, all the way to Lockbourne, it's 
kind of staggering to to think that Marion Village was that big. So um, we're all and we're still we've got at least 3,300 households. That's actually grown since there have been some new um, housing developments in Marion Village. But we're we're pretty darn big. I think we're one of the biggest in in the area, if not the biggest. So yeah. to to think that we were significantly larger is pretty crazy. Okay, anybody else have anything they want to say or share before we adjourn for tonight? All right, I think that's it then. Thank you, everyone. David, thank you for organizing our speaker. Stephen, thank you for being our speaker. Tate, thank you for helping to coordinate and, and being our, our zoning chair because that is an important role. Appreciate all of you and look forward to seeing everyone again at next month's meeting. Have a great night, folks.